Hey all, Eric Christensen here from MedEd 101. Going to cover GLP-1 agonists. Uh, really focus on a few of the clinical pearls, things that I see in my practice as a uh, clinical pharmacist. Uh, first important point, I have no conflicts of interest, never spoke for any of the drug companies that are, are mentioned here, the, the drugs that are mentioned here, I should say. So GOP-1 agonists, so examples, liraglutide, exenatide, dulaglutide, these are the uh, most common examples um, that I typically see in, in my practice being utilized right now. Incretin mimetics is basically what, what they are. So incretin is a hormone within your body that enhances glucose-dependent insulin secretion. So what does that mean? High blood sugar, a.k.a. after we eat, incretin helps bring that down by stimulating insulin production. So these drugs are going to target those postprandial blood sugars. They're going to hopefully help, help bring those down. It also suppresses inappropriate glucagon secretion uh, and slows gastric emptying. So kind of two important you know, points with that, that kind of mechanism of slowing gastric emptying. One, a lot of diabetic patients have gastroparesis. Now, is this a clinically significant effect or not? Uh, I personally haven't seen too many issues with it at, yet at this point. I think there needs to be a lot more um, studying on this effect, if it does matter or not. Uh, however, it, it is something that's that's maybe on my radar, especially if people are having GI side effects or, or concerns that way. So um, that's kind of the, the one, one important point. The other point is um, weight loss. You know, slowing gastric emptying can, you know, promote a, a more fullness. Patients may feel more satisfied. They won't eat as much as hopefully uh, the, the goal with that, that increase in the, the incretin or the incretin mimetic. Uh, so those meaningful clinical pearls, uh, weight loss. So that's a really important thing uh, for diabetic patients. We're always struggling with that. You know, we put them on sulfonylureas, we put them on insulin, and they can definitely contribute to some weight gain. So uh, a drug uh, that can at least be weight neutral and, and potentially help uh, contribute to weight loss can certainly be a, a welcomed uh, welcomed advantage uh, with these potential medications. Um, cost. Cost is a major, major concern. Uh, these drugs are several hundred dollars cash price and no, very, very few patients uh, will be able and or willing to afford these medications uh, if they had to pay a, a cash price for them. So insurance coverage seems to dictate uh, which which one is, is utilized. Uh, they are an injection. So every once in a while, I'll, I'll get a patient that's very, very reluctant to uh, doing any kind of injection. And obviously, you know, most patients think of insulin when they think of injection. Uh, but these medications, uh, th that is the only way they're given. So uh, a little caveat to that is, you know, we do have um, some of these agents now that are, are once weekly dosing as an injection. So that's definitely a, an advantage, um, you know, over the, the once or twice daily dosing for something like exenatide um, and, and something to, to think about um, when potentially selecting these medications. GI side effects. So these are, are probably the most common side effects, you know, nausea, stomach upset. Uh, typically, uh, well, hopefully patients can um, handle it for, for a short period of time. Hopefully it isn't too severe um, that, that they, they have to quit the drug right away and we can't utilize them. Um, but hopefully titrating up uh, appropriately um, for some of them is uh, the best way to go. And like I said, hopefully patients can kind of work through them, especially if they um, 
have those side effects in the, the short term and at least give them an adequate trial um, before, you know, they let's say they have a day or two of side effects and they want to throw it out the window. Um, typically, as long as it's not severe, you know, we're, we're going to try to encourage patients to try to stick with it and, and hopefully um, get a little used to the, the new medication um, and, and work work through that a little bit. Again, you know, that's all patient-specific and um, it can be a, a challenge um, to, to figure out how severe those side effects are. So uh, hypoglycemia. This is obviously a lot more prevalent in, in patients that are on insulin or on drugs that stimulate the release of insulin like sulfonylureas. So something to, to keep an eye out for there for sure. Thyroid cancer, there is a boxed warning. So if you ever have a patient that you know you see in their diagnosis list or that you know you know them from past experience that they have had thyroid cancer, um, there is a, a boxed warning uh, on that. So that's definitely something um I keep in the, the back of my mind. Pancreatitis is another one that I kind of keep in the, the back of my mind. We've There's been some kind of case reports and, and different uh, discussions about pancreatitis. Um, so if you know a patient has pancreatitis, this might not be the ideal drug to start. Or if you know they've had issues with that in the past, um, if we can look towards another class, maybe we do that. Uh, A1C lowering. Uh, you know, this kind of varies based upon dose and also patient specific factors if they're eating well, if their diet's good. Um, now, compared to, you know, a year ago, obviously that can impact the A1C as well as the, the medication. But a ballpark 0.5, 1%, somewhere in there um, in studies is typically where um, these, these drugs have, have fallen as far as drop in, in A1C. We're not going to use these with DPP-4 inhibitors. Uh, they work the same way. And now if you're transitioning from one to the other, or doing something wacky, you know, there might be a brief period of overlap time or something like that. But um, by and large, we're not, we're not going to add these drugs on top of uh, citagliptin or other agent uh, of that nature. Hopefully this was helpful for you guys. Uh, working on a big project at MedEd 101, um, BCPS study guide should be out late 2017. I think it'll be really helpful for anyone um, going forward looking at, at BCPS uh, exam. Also plenty of, of other stuff as far as NAPLEX, uh, geriatrics, uh, ambulatory care study material as well on MedEd 101. Feel free to check it out. Uh, any comments on the, the video are appreciated. And uh, yeah, hope you have a good day.